So today I'm going to talk about the Emacs IPython notebook. Um, this is the plan. I haven't really timed myself out, so I have a feeling I can get through all of this in 20, 25 minutes, and then maybe we'll do a demo, and there will be time after that for questions, hopefully. Um, my style, I've noticed these presentations, people tend to wait until the end for questions and comments. Um, I kind of like, I don't mind if you guys have a question while I'm talking, just raise your hand. Uh, might take us somewhere interesting, so feel free to interrupt if you want. Um, let's go on a little bit. So first, a little disclaimer. Uh, I work for a company named Honeywell UOP, and if you've been around long enough, you would know that that company used to be named UOP, and if you've, you've been around for a really long time, you'd know that company used to be called Universal Oil Products. I'm not here today for them. Uh, they don't know anything about this work I'm doing. I'm fine with that. They're probably fine with that. Um, it, it is an interesting company. If you want to learn more about it, feel free to come by after the presentation and talk to me. All right, so I also want to first get some thanks out of the way. First, um, this guy, uh, he is the reason Ein exists. Um, Takafumi, I've only corresponded with him very briefly many years ago, just before I forked it. Um, but the guy is insane. I think he did like some like 1,800 commits in the space of two years. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what he did when I get to the history of Ein, but. Um, if I were to meet this guy in person, I definitely owe him a beer, sake, something, because really he, he changed my life with this, with this software. Um, I also like thank Fernando and the rest of the Jupiter project, um, O'Reilly for uh, sponsoring me and helping me get here and coordinating all this. Um, a couple of years ago, a company, DE Shaw, who's actually based here in New York, they actually uh, paid me to do some work on Ein. Um, I'm eternally grateful for them for that. That just was beyond my wildest expectations. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank um, all the people on GitHub who have started my project. At the moment, there's like 660. Um, I never expected that there would be that many people interested in this project. I think on Melpa, it says there's been 50,000 downloads of the Emacs IPython notebook, and I'm just totally blown away by that. Um, I know it doesn't compare to Jupyter or the rest, but I'm just one guy. And any interest at all, just uh, uh, just Makes me so happy. All right, so me. Uh, I graduated from Colorado State University in 1997. I double majored in chemical engineering and computer science. Uh, so that makes me a bit strange. Um, from there, I went straight into UOP. It was UOP at the time. And really, that's a company for chemical engineers, not computer science guys. So I've really been doing chemical engineering work for the past 20 years. Computer science is just kind of a side hobby for me. Uh, I've been using Emacs since college, maybe 95, 96. Uh, I was taking a grad level course in AI, and they were, all the work was done, homework was done in Common Lisp, and if you're programming in Lisp, you pretty much need to use Emacs. Uh, I've been fiddling around with Python since 1998. I actually used it when I first started at my job. I uh, used Zope uh, to build a website for my group I was working at at the time. Uh, then I stopped using Python for many years, maybe until six, seven years ago that I discovered pandas and was able to finally free myself from Excel workbooks. Um, because uh, in my organization, if you're a chemi working in the industry I do, pretty much everything happens in an Excel workbook, which is depressing. Anyways, uh, and pretty around that time I discovered the IPython notebook. I uh, bounced, to be honest, bounced off the web interface a bit until I found this project, the Emacs, Emacs IPython Notebook. Um, and then I kind of took over as maintainer in 2014, 2015, uh, because uh, TKF, he just kind of disappeared. So let's uh, talk about Emacs IPython Notebook finally. It is a, in my opinion, a full featured client for the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and it's existed since roughly 2012. Uh, it tries to be a bit like Slime. If you know Emacs a little bit, that's a, the superior Lisp interaction mode for Emacs. It's a tool for interacting with common Lisp. Uh, it allows you to interact with the REPL, uh, interactively execute code, inspect code, uh, look at debug code, and, and I try to be like that. Uh, it works on most recent versions of Emacs. 
and um, it's written almost completely in Elis, with the exception of a few Python functions that kind of glue in the IDE features. Um, it has a slew of IDE features. It integrates with the Python debugger. Uh, it integrates with org mode. I don't know if any of you here know org mode. Live and die by org mode. Yes, yes. I've tried really hard to make it work reasonably well with org mode. Um, I'll try and demo it a little bit later. Uh, just recently, I've made sure it works with non-Python kernels. Uh, I really don't know anything other than uh, Python and, and, and uh, Elis, but uh, I did test it with an R kernel, and it actually kind of worked. Um, and then here's the last one, which is kind of cool. Uh, too bad Joel's gone. But uh, we can connect Python buffers to running kernels and get completion and autodoc and uh, uh, stuff like that for free in a Python buffer. So Emacs. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with Emacs. That's probably why you're here. <laughs> so here's my one obligatory XKCD. Um, so yeah, if, if you know Emacs, whatever you want to do, there's probably an Emacs command that does it for you. And um, I don't want to be snide, but as I was watching a lot of these presentations to myself, I was thinking, yeah, Emacs, I think Emacs can, can do that, especially watching the Jupyter Lab presentation. Um, nothing against those guys. I think it's great that, uh, uh, that they're putting all these features together, but a lot of the stuff uh, <clears throat> Emacs is, Emacs iPython notebooks had for like the past four or five years. Anyways, why do I use Emacs? Originally this was why Emacs, but that felt a little presumptuous. Um, I'm not gonna tell anybody that they have to use Emacs. Uh, it's kind of an acquired taste. Um, uh, it's either you bounce off of it real hard or it just transforms your life and becomes everything. Um, I, I was looking for good images that represent Emacs. I found this and I thought it was pretty funny. This guy is running a Tetris game in a frame. I don't know how many editors can do that. Who would want to write that in an editor? But anyways, um, so in my mind, when I think of Emacs and why I use it, uh, this first thing I thought about was a list machine. I don't know if any of you know about list machines. I, I, I was, unfortunately, I was too young to really work with any list machines. And I'm a little bit too old to be part of this data science wave. So I'm kind of stuck in the middle. But anyways, uh, Emacs is kind of like the scrappier cousin from the wrong side of town when you think of a list machine. Um, I think it's telling that Emacs has endured so long. It's been around 40 years. And people are still using it, obviously. Um, I was reading about a week ago, there's a couple of really good blog posts by this guy, Josh Stella, that kind of explain why he likes Emacs so much. And I felt really resonated with me. And I, I think uh, a couple of points is it's a tool that you control completely. It's your tool. It allows you to focus completely. There is no distractions when you're working with Emacs. And um, the Emacs IPython notebook tool really buys into that philosophy, I think. And that's why I like in using it so much in my work. Um, I don't really want to get in, didn't want to get into editor wars. I know that's a very popular act, pastime activity. Um, but I think it's great that there's alternate clients out there. I think it's great there's Jupyter Lab. I think it's great there's Interact. Um, I think it's a sign of a healthy community that you have multiple tools out there and they can all interact, all learn from each other. So let's do a little bit of history of Ein. Now, there was supposed to be a graph in here. But it's gone. So, well, let's do this. I lost myself here. I, I worked so hard in Microsoft PowerPoint to build this graph, I have to show it to you but it doesn't want to show. There we go. So, okay, 2012 is the first commit to the Emacs IPython notebook. Around March of 2014, uh, that was the last commit by TKF. About a month later, I forked it. 
This was the, about the time when IPython was going from version 1.0 to 2.0. There were a lot of changes to um, the interface, to the communication protocol, and um, you know, IPython, Emacs, Ein just wasn't keeping up. So I think it, TKF kind of got burned out by all those changes and just stopped committing. So I just took over and managed to get it working on 2.0, and I've been running with it ever since. Um, you know, in April 2014, there was a version 0 0.3. I'm now at, what, version 14.1. Um, it works with Jupyter. There's over 650 stars on GitHub and over 50,000 downloads from Melta. So, um, you know, it's kept up with the times for the most part, and I'm really happy with it. Uh, so just going through that a little bit. Yeah, 1,795 commits by this one guy. Um, I think we're at like 2,500 commits, so that's, that means 800 commits are mine in the space of four years. So I'm no master programmer, I'm just a guy. Um, I will say though that, yeah, going from uh, IPython 1.0 to today's Jupyter, that was, there was rough sailing for a while. Um, there were a number of real challenges I had to get through. One, there were changes to the contents API. That's, that's the, uh, the file view browser view that you'll see. Um, there were big changes there. There were some changes to the communication protocol, um, changes to the security model. That was probably the most painful uh, for me to try and work through. And then there's some changes to the no notebook format. Um, all of those worked through, but now everything seems to be really stable on the Jupyter side. I hope it stays that way. Um, honestly, the, they've, they've been really good about that. I may complain about, about things, but they've been really good about keeping things stable. Um, it made me so happy when they m mentioned in the last presentation that uh, they made no backwards incompatible changes to the notebook format. Um, because that code is really horrible. Um, it's probably the worst piece of code I've, I've written as, as a programmer. Um, why these things were hard? Because I get a little shy and embarrassed outside of Emacs. Um, I'm kind of old, so I don't understand all these newfangled web technologies. Um, I break out in highs whenever I try to read JavaScript. So it's been kind of hard to try and understand that, but the documentation from Jupyter has been really good. Um, the people in the distribution have been really helpful. Um, Matthias, Brian, those guys have been really helpful and patient with me as I come up with the occasional question. Um, also, when I'm trying to support users, this seems to be the most common issue when post, people post to GitHub is I get, I can't connect to a notebook or the kernel's not running. And, um, those are really hard because I have to be able to reproduce the problem. And Emacs' greatest advantage, maybe its greatest disadvantage, is that it's so configurable. So usually it turns out the issue is with the way that they've configured their installation. Um, and it's just me trying to work through uh, what that is. And usually there's nothing I can do to bulletproof it. It's just change your configuration. So. Those were the challenges. What's, what have I loved about this, the, the, this project? And it's a short list, but really the joys have greatly outweighed the challenges because in part, the challenges have been the joy. It's a, a, quite a rush when you have this really difficult problem and you find a way to fix it. And, and that keeps me going. Um, there are people out there that use it. There are people in professional organizations that are using Emacs and the Emacs IPython notebook, which is just great. Um, it's not, I never expected that. I, I use it for me mostly, but that other people use it is, is great. Um, the community, the people on GitHub are, are really nice. Um, they're really supportive. And finally, I like to program in Lisp. Um, and I get to do that and do something that, that's, that's useful for people at the end of the day. I mean, you can't, it doesn't get better than that. So let's dive a little bit into Ein's features. Um, because I don't know, how many of you here have actually used the Emacs IPython notebook? Okay, probably back in like the IPython pre 1.0. Yeah, I, I, I got the messages from that from people on the um, Jupyter list that they stopped using it because it stopped working. Um, you know, when I forked it, 
definitely a lot of people that were using it didn't weren't aware of the fork and so it's taken a lot of time for people to come back so emacs ipython notebook it tries to look a lot like um, the notebook interface except it's more text-like um, a lot of the features that are there in the on the web interface are also in, in emacs um, you can cut copy and paste cells you can move cells around um, it has inline images you can work with multiple kernels. Um, all that's there. It also has a number of IDE-like features. I think this puts it more in the realm of like the Jupyter Lab folk. Um, there's auto completion, which um, if you have it configured right, works really, really well. If, but it can be a bit of a pain to configure. Uh, we can jump to definitions of functions. A uh, bunch of other stuff. I'm going to try and demo some of this later. Um, we'll see. And the, 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 I was actually really, I'm, I really like this integration with the uh, debugger because uh, you can actually see the code as you're stepping through. Um, I don't think that's not something that you'll find on, on the web browser interface. Um, there's a number of things that are, that I, that are unique to Emacs. It's probably some of the IDE stuff was also unique to Emacs. But um, you can launch Jupyter from inside Emacs. If you configure it correctly, it'll open up a buffer and it'll log everything from the Jupyter server there. Uh, you can execute ELIS from IPython. The code that does this is kind of old, so it, it works, but um, I, I, I executed it and then opened this notebook up in the Roy browser and it complained about some stuff. Um, it integrates with org mode. So you can have uh, source blocks in org mode, they'll execute, the results will go into your org buffer. Um, including images. Um, support for high. Have any of you heard of high? Um, I actually saw that and was like, oh, I have to support this in, in Emacs. I mean, you have a Lisp for Python, Python with a Lisp syntax, and it's not running in Emacs. I mean, come on, guys. Uh, the uh, Callisto high kernel. We can do that, but I can also intermix. Uh -huh. I'll show you. I'll show you if we get to it. Um, you can connect a Python buffer to a running notebook, which means it has access to a lot of the stuff that's available in the kernel, like, which is auto completion and doc tools. Um, you can customize it using Elisp, not JavaScript. Emacs doesn't know JavaScript. Uh, who has pop up, yeah, and then run, run doc tests. Those are things I don't use a whole lot. Um, You'll find that the stuff that works really well in Emacs in EIN is stuff that I use in my day-to-day -day stuff <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, there's some stuff that definitely needs a lot of tender loving care. Um, there used to be a feature to take a pandas data frame and open it in the, the simple Emacs spreadsheet. Uh, I tried that a couple of times, but the performance is, is especially if it's a large data frame, uh, Emacs will really struggle with that. Um, you used to be able to use the hierarchy magic to get a um, hierarchy of a class and embed that in the notebook. Um, it's based on a notebook extension that was written for pre-IPython 1.0. So it's not going to work with modern Jupyter. That, that extension needs to be uh, updated. Uh, guess who's the maintainer of that? The one who wrote that? TKF. Um, but it probably wouldn't take a whole lot of work, really, honestly, to get it working. So there's a few things that EIN does not do at all, and it's possible may never do. Uh, number one on those is widgets. That's because Emacs is not a web browser. Um, you know, there's some hope with maybe with X widget and embedding the web browser inside the Emacs buffer. Um, there's also the skewer package. Uh, that, that might allow widgets to run in some form, maybe not there in the Emacs buffer, but at least in another window, maybe. But it's not something I really need to use. Uh, the effort involved is going to be probably pretty significant, so I don't know if it's, it's going to happen anytime too, soon. Um, most notebook extensions probably won't work with Emacs because the notebook extension will have some JavaScript in it. And again, Emacs doesn't know JavaScript, knows how to edit JavaScript. Great JavaScript editor. 
but it doesn't know how to execute it. Um, but if you want to take the time to translate JavaScript into Emacs Lisp, you can make it work. I took a, one, this really simple module, the timestamp module that timestamp sells, um, wrote a couple of functions in Elisp, and, and it basically has the same function as that, that extension. So in theory, if somebody wanted to write a, a, an extension for EIN, they could do so if they wanted to learn Elisp. Um, EIN sort of supports JupyterHub. I'd like that support to be better. We'll see if I can get to it or not. Uh, it, it is a bit wonky. Last I looked, I think uh, it worked with Jupyter version 0 0.8, but it only supported the PAM authorization. I don't know if it'll support what it'll take to get it to, to do OAuth, um, but that would be nice. And again, that's kind of, yeah. Um, like manipulating the DOM? Yeah, like, or no, if like somebody sends you know, some divs or some styles text. So it won't know how to render it nicely, but I mean, if it's there in the cell, it'll show up. Um, you know, it, it does some nice syntax highlighting. It, it knows how to uh, syntax highlight like Markdown and Python. And, and I'll kind of show that when I open up the, 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 uh, the example. So what's next? Um, I just want to make sure it stay compatible with Jupyter. Um, always like it to be more robust. I kind of wish I could make it to the point where I don't get these not connecting to kernel questions. Though it seems to be lately they're all related to um, SSH issues, which I guess that's, that's something that's better than having a local running instance and not being able to connect to it. Um, uh, and there's a number of stuff. I have, a, I have an org file with a long list of, of improvements I like to lay, make. I think they've been sitting around for like three, four years. Um, but someday, someday. So why don't we go ahead and do a little example. If there are any questions before I move on to the example demo. All right, so this is what, if you haven't seen it before, this is what the Emacs IPython looks like when you first launch the notebook list view. Um, so kind of reminiscent of the web view. You know, down here are the, uh, the files. You can actually open files that aren't IPython notebooks and edit them. So let's say, for example, this pavement pie. Um, there are some issues. So we've got this Python buffer and it's actually connected to the notebook server. So if I save this file here, it actually gets saved on the server. So um, this is one way of doing remote file editing. I know Emacs has Tramp. I'd really like it if Ein had a IPython Tramp protocol. I think that would be really cool. Um, that would be very Emacsy. But again, it's something that requires time and effort. I'm not sure if I'll get to it. So let's go to this presentation, which when I was writing, this is the actual presentation I just gave you. Um, I wrote it all in Emacs. I was gonna try and put it in a PowerPoint presentation, but I rage quit after a few minutes of trying to try and copy stuff over to, to PowerPoint. And um, thank, thanks to uh, IPython and Rise, we had the presentation that we did. So let's go down here a little bit. We went to the demonstration. So looking at this interface real quick, so you see up in this upper left corner, there's the execution count. Um, this one, actually back in the day, I supported multiple worksheets. It kind of still does. The problem is, is it IPython itself doesn't do worksheets anymore. So it'd be a little bit of work on my end, but I could bring that back if, it, if, if, if people were interested. Um, and then the kernel that's running, which you can change, you can also reset the kernel, um, and then you can execute. And it's just like in IPython, like in the notebook. Now, 
I want you to watch carefully, and this was all inspired by Joel's talk earlier about what he hated about the IPython notebook. I don't know if any of you saw that. Um, so watch carefully. No execution count, nothing up my sleeves. I haven't executed this line. I haven't ex executed import sys in anywhere in this notebook, I promise. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is using the uh, Jedi package, and it's using Jedi. So it's not actually talking to the kernel. Actually, what it does um, in this instance is querying Jedi, and it's querying the kernel, and it's figuring out which one has the results. And the kernel is probably saying, I don't know. But Jedi, because it, it statically goes through, it knows. And, and um, you can actually uh, get some completion. Now, this only supports, if you guys know about the Emacs completion packages, there's autocomplete and there's company. And I have some support for company, but, but what I just showed here really only works with autocomplete. Um, maybe with company Jedi, I could get this working with, with company mode as well. Uh, let's just say, say hello world. All right. I'm going to go down here real quick and set my plotting parameters so this plot doesn't look too cool. And so what's the shortcut for execution of the set? Is that the same? It, it's Emacs. It can be whatever you want. But so what did you want? Um, so I'm use, I use SpaceMax. So in SpaceMax, uh, you can have like a special mode key, which for, in this case, it's comma. So I do comma return. And that executes the cell. But if you wanted to be shift return, you could do that. And what was the command that he used to start the first? Ah, uh, to open the notebook? Yeah, to get going the Sure. So here's the notebook list view, notebook list buffer. <laughs> so oh, okay. Ooh, you're right. Okay, why don't we do this then? I'm gonna start from nothing. So this command I'm typing in right now, that stops the Jupyter server. Let's do that. Let's kill that buffer. Let's make sure uh, there's no running. Gotcha. And then let's do this. A, Y, S. So I just uh, execute the command ein Jupyter start server. You can configure the name of the Jupyter command. Um, there's a variable for that. If, it, if that variable is not set, it'll ask you for a path to the Jupyter server. Then it'll ask you for a path to where you want the server to open, which is doing right now. Um, and I've got this nice little default, so let's start that. And my fingers are crossed. It's gonna take a little bit to start up the server, which I can probably jump to right now. There it is. Hopefully, I haven't confused Emacs. There we go. It's trying to log in. And there we go. There's the browser. This is probably the easiest way to get it running um, on your local machine, is the I and Jupyter server start. And it brings up this. It's called the notebook list view or notebook list buffer. And it works pretty much like it does on the web interface. So I'm going to go to the Emacs IPython notebook project directory, um, go back down, and then you just select open. So here we are, back again. So it started up the kernel, um, new, new execution, so it's at zero count, and here we are. So clear? Was it clear? You're, you're very welcome. So where was I? Oh, I was going to do an inline plot. Because this is what got me started in the first place. I liked using matplotlib to generate pretty plots for my work. Because um, I think they're a lot prettier than uh, what Excel does. So let's do this. I didn't execute. All right. Oh. So you can't put comments in magic lines. Let's do this. There we go. 
I know. I know that looks really small, I'm sorry. I'll see if I can get this again. There we go. <laughs> um, the, the, that's the good news. The bad news is um, stuff like Boca, um, Altair, Vega, they won't work because they use JavaScript and that won't run in Emacs. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I was working on this, my motivation is how can this help me do my work? And, and I think, um, you know, the IPython in the notebook, this system for doing exploratory data analysis, um, manipulating data, that was really my focus at the time. Because as a chem -E, I work in the service department, and um, some of what my job is is looking at trying to troubleshoot problems on chemical process units, and so we get a lot of time series data. And so we got to work through that data, and sometimes you get the data in really weird formats, and having something like Pandas makes it really nice to, to manipulate and work with that data, and having something like Matplotlib is really nice for generating uh, graphs to look at the data and, and, and share them with your colleagues. So really, that was been a lot of my motivation with, with this project. Um, and, you know, I think that the fact that it's kind of been this nice environment is a really nice uh, 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 benefit or secondary effect of, of, of all this. Um, you know, I, I haven't really done a whole lot to promote it over the years, but I think there's probably some good lessons here for people that are developing other uh, uh, clients, but, you know, that's not for me. Uh, anyways, so we also have a help browser. So it pops up a buffer. You can space through it if it's, oh, I forgot. You can go through it, right? Makes it a little easier to read. Um, if you're really masochistic, you can also do pop-ups. It'll do a pop-up. There's a fairly good integration with uh, the debugger support. So you'll get errors when things don't work. Um, you get tracebacks. If you want to get a full view of the traceback, this is not true, terribly interesting because there's only one level to it. Um, if I think it's return. Uh, that didn't work, unfortunately. But you can jump to source from the tracebacks. Uh, we'll, we'll see with this next one. Hey, look, there's raccoons. Let's do this. So there's a traceback of that. So I can actually jump to that file. Fingers crossed. There we go. We just jumped to the file and the line that was referenced in the traceback. If I want, I can go into the debugger. If I want to know and see it popped up for me, it's already showing me in the code where this error occurred. If you can, I don't know if it's, if you can see it, there's a little arrow, tiny, tiny, tiny little arrow in the fringe. Um, I can go up a stack and you can see it's moved with us. I can basically do the stuff that you would normally do in the Python debugger. For the most part, supports that completely. Uh, I don't know if you get that in Jupyter Lab yet. 
but I've actually used it a few times and it's very useful. And there they go. Now, okay, somebody mentioned hi. Um, I'm gonna have to change the cell type. So, so this is a Python kernel. Um, prior to this, I installed the hi module for this kernel. Uh, you can set in EIN a special cell type. We call it the cell, the Hein cell. And it will execute high. And it's executing in Python. If you don't believe me, watch this. So I'm going to set this variable, high var. And, oops, this, that shouldn't be. There we go. This next cell is Python. There it is. So I don't know why you do that, but you can. Um, you can also use the load magic. As you can see, it'll create a new cell with the file. Um, there's a special, I don't know if you're org, you're use, if you're aware of the edit source blocks, it pops up a new buffer with the source and it's in the mode of the code. Uh, language that, that the code is, we can do something similar with EIN. So I just did that here. So here's uh, basically a Python buffer with all the benefits that that bring with it because in Emacs there's quite a few uh, packages out there that, that make editing Python better. I can execute it, I can modify, I'm not going to do that. And then we're back in the, back in the notebook. Now, I'm running out of time, so real quickly, we're going to go to, did I open it? Test pie. All right, I'm going to connect this, connect to notebook buffer. So we can actually execute this. I'm going to comment that out. And it goes to what we call the, um, what I call, what is called the shared buffer. Um, you don't see anything there, but we can do this. Which didn't work when I wanted, but I can go back to the notebook and you see we've, we've created this digits variable and it should be available in the notebook. And there it is. Now, in this Python buffer, um, I get all the goodies that I have in the notebook. So uh, load digits, I can bring up the pop-up help. Uh, I get I can jump to source. I didn't find it. Darn it. Um, and auto completion, I think I mentioned auto completion. All right. Data sets. I haven't imported the module, and, and Jedi probably doesn't know about this, but uh, we get the auto completion. I'm hurting myself because I, I want to leave you time for some questions. Um, there's this one last thing there's this thing called import magic. Um, that uh, if, you know, if I were to try to execute this, and really what's happening uh, when I execute is it's doing a run on the file, you know, magic run. Uh, it's not like Lisp where you can redefine individual functions. You, you have to reload the whole file. But anyway, so um, there's this package called import magic, um, and it'll try and fix. So as you can see, I hadn't imported the OS path join. So there, somewhere in nine, there's an error saying it didn't know about that. So I can fix that. And as you can see, it added it. And I could probably there we go. And it errored because I didn't save the buffer before trying to connect. So. Hmm. 
Why is it doing that? All right, well, so much for that demo. Anyways, um, I guess that was just a talk, um, an introduction to Ein and its features. I need to stop now. So I wanted to thank you all for coming. And um, you, know, you can find me this, once this gets published. You, there's contact information. Uh, look for me on GitHub or on email. And um, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I didn't play with it too much, but it will connect to a Callisto High and works mostly. The, the problem with Ein is it's very Python-centric still. So the notebook itself, it probably won't give you as nice a syntax formatting um, as, as you expect for Lisp, Lisp code. So it's not great for writing large expressions. but <clears throat> You know, if you were to do a buffer and then connect it to a, a high buffer and connect it to the kernel, I think that would work. If not, it might not be too work, too much work to get it to, to happen. The, the magics come from the, uh, the language, the, the kernel? So what I do to get it to intermingle, um, I wrote a little pi function that basically wraps calls to the um, syntax uh, you know, the, um, the parser and evaluator. And then Python, what I do on Emacs is I wrap that, the text of that cell and then send it to the kernel and execute that function. And it works. I was surprised it works, but it, it does. I don't do a whole lot in high. I haven't found a use case for it in what I do, but I thought it was kind of cool that, that I could get it to work. It will try to print data frames, um, and it kind of looks like a text table, which, if you have a really wide pandas frame, looks really, really ugly. But, but it will kind of try to do that. Uh, HTML, you know, it's basically Emacs HTML, so it'll show the markup. Um, if you get install the right package, you can get um, some LaTeX like image, inline image replacement of LaTeX and your markdown cells? No, it, um, what was the name of that? Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, I, what is it? so what is the inline LaTeX? Yeah, so I think uh, it was either org LaTeX preview or magic LaTeX buffer. Um, it was one of those two. If you install one of those, it actually goes through the, the trouble of inserting in the image, generating and inserting the image. Um, but as far as, as MIME types, I mean, it does try to handle HTML, but it's not a rendered HTML.